Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lou Ann Rourke, Executive Director of the Look Good Feel Better program. I'm delighted to be here today for this Feel Better session on how to sleep better. In a few moments, I'll be joined by our special guest, Dr. Azizi Seishas. Before we begin, I want to take just a quick moment to introduce you to the Look Good Feel Better program. For more than 30 years, Look Good Feel Better has provided free workshops to people with cancer to help them really understand how to manage the appearance-related side effects of cancer treatment. Our professional beauty volunteers provide lessons on skin care and nails, cosmetics, wigs, turbans, head coverings, even accessories and styling. As many of you may know, addressing the appearance side effects of cancer treatment is not only uplifting, studies have shown that helping people reassert their control over how they look truly can impact how they feel. Confidence and self-esteem improve after a Look Good Feel Better workshop. Today, Look Good Feel Better is available in 27 countries all around the world, including here in the US. Our program is open to all women with cancer who are undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, or other forms of cancer treatment. If you or someone you love would benefit from attending a Look Good Feel Better workshop, please visit us at lookgoodfeelbetter.org for more information and to access our live virtual workshop schedule. While the pandemic kept us all safely at home, our live virtual platform allowed us to stay connected and in contact with women undergoing cancer treatment. That experience is what really inspired this undertaking, Feel Better Sessions. I think we can all agree that we are due for just a little bit of hope and positivity. That's what today is all about, taking a little time to feel better. A quick housekeeping note before we begin. If you have not already done so, please consider joining our weekly raffle. Each time that you make a donation of $10 to Look Good Feel Better, your name is entered into our drawing for some fantastic beauty prizes. You can use the donation button on your screen now, or you can text us at feel good to 44321. Don't forget to leave us your email so we can contact you if you win. Now for the main event. Dr. Azizi Seishas is an assistant professor at New York University's Medical Center at Langone Health Center. But his career can't be summed up in just one title. Dr. Seishas is also a seasoned and successful biomedical researcher and scientist. He has over 150 publications. He's a communicator, a health tech innovator, a sought after speaker, and an expert consultant to some of the world's most recognizable organizations from CVS Aetna, Google Cloud, and Facebook to Everly Well and NBC News, where he's the in house sleep expert to NBC Health News. His research and opinions have been featured in top media giants such as CNN, CBS, The Sun, Men's Health Magazine and the Huffington Post. Dr. Seisha serves on the board of directors for Moshi Sleep and Mindfulness and advises several health and tech companies. And for all his work, he was recognized as one of the top 100 most inspiring black scientists by America by Cell Press. He is also chair for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, Sleep Medicine Disruptors Conference and Change Agents Program, vice chair of the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Committee, for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And he serves on the American Heart Association's Cardiac Rehab Advisory Group, just to name a few. And most importantly, perhaps, he's the husband to Megan and father to two young children, Zara and Kari. So Dr. Seishas knows just how important sleep is and how it can be really hard to come by at some points in our lives. So now, without further ado, welcome Dr. Seishas. Thank you, Luan. Um, thank you so much for such a very kind introduction. Um, and one thing I will say is that um, all of those 
um, titles and responsibilities and activities that you shared. Um, being a great husband and father um, means the most um, to me. So thank you so much. And I'm really happy um, to be invited and honored to be with your um, attendees. Well, we, are, we are really pleased and honored to have you with us today. And I'm just going to start right at the beginning, which is how did you get interested in sleep? Other than as an individual who needs it. <laughs> You know, I, I I think you know sleep is such a fundamental um, activity and behavior, um, and it's something that I myself struggle with. It's something that family members and friends struggle with, um, and so it has always been an important area for me as a scientist to study. But a little bit of serendipity um, brought me into the field. Um, I was extremely blessed and honored to be given the opportunity to be part of a training program at NYU School of Medicine when I was at another institution. Um, this particular program um, trains um, over 175 underrepresented minorities in biomedical research, and I was so happy to be one of those a few years ago. And that particular program focuses on sleep and behavioral medicine. And when I got into that program, Luan, my world was changed. I realized that I thought I got good sleep, but I was not getting good sleep. And so just over that entire training program, my life changed and I became a sleep evangelist. So that's what brought me to the sleep field. Great intro and great start. I think we can all relate to that just a little bit in terms of understanding how, how much we really need the sleep that we're not getting. Sure, sure. So we spend about a third of our lives sleeping. It's something that we need like air and water in our lives. So why can sleep be such a challenge for some of us? Wow, that's, that's a great question. And I actually love the fact that you equated sleep with air um, and water because it is fundamental. We can't do without sleep. But as you rightfully pointed out that there are significant challenges that prevent us from getting the adequate and good quality sleep that our body craves and needs. But here are some potential barriers that get in the way. Um, one is personal. So we have um, some personal factors that might actually prevent us from getting good sleep, such as our biologists. Um, there's this idea where our biological clocks may not be well aligned with night and day. And as a result, we may not actually get good sleep. Um, so that's one um, factor. There might be clinical factors as well. Some people may have clinical disorders like insomnia as well as sleep apnea, which is a, a sleep breathing condition um, that is characterized by partial or full blockage of someone's airflow when they are sleeping. And there might be some behavioral factors as well. Also, family. Um, what we know, and especially over this past year or so, um, when everyone had to deal with maintaining a somewhat normal life while doing all of the important things that you have to do in family, that life can be very demanding. And having two, three kids and working full time can cause a tremendous amount of strain and oftentimes sleep gets shortchanged. There are also societal and cultural barriers to getting good sleep. So our attitudes about sleep, particularly in North America and in the West, we think that sleep is a nuisance. And we believe that sleep prevents us from doing the normal things that we want to do. In fact, um, many people oftentimes brag that they only got four hours of sleep. Um, and, and, and they do it in a way to show some sense of bravado, some form of efficiency and industriousness, but that can be to their peril. And there are some professional barriers as well. Some of us work in jobs that are highly stressed. Some of us work in jobs where we may not get regular good sleep because of shift work. And environmental factors are also important, such as you, uh, you have noxious noise, what we call noise pollution, um, light pollution, not having the right temperature where you sleep can serve as a significant barrier 
And last but not least, because since this is a program about um, you know, feeling good and feeling better, is the psychological barriers, stress. And what we've seen over the last year, that stress has evolved into what we call this revenge sleep delay. And what this basically says is, if I'm working 14 hours for the day at home, and I have two, three kids, and I have to cook dinner, and I have to pay the bills and all of those things, once I put my kids to bed and I'm done with work, I am going to delay my sleep because I need one or two extra hours to maybe binge on social media or to binge on some form of show. And therefore, it delays when we go to bed. So we're actually heading to bed much later than we ought to, even though contrary to believe that we're at home, so we think we should be getting more sleep. So those are just some um, barriers that prevent us from getting good sleep. Those are a lot of barriers. It's a lot of things to consider you know, about your sleep. What does science tell us about the importance of good sleep and maybe the consequences of poor sleep? So I think earlier I um, used the word primordial and that's very jargon, but it means fundamental. It means that we can't do anything without sleep. Our bodies will crumble if we don't get adequate sleep. And so I want to highlight the importance of sleep. And I use this acronym called REST. R stands for restoration. That's the important thing. Sleep allows us to restore our bodies, restore our biological functioning, helps to conserve energy. That's what the E stands for. The S stands for stability. There's this process in our bodies called homeostasis. Some of us might be going back to, um, you know, grade school biology when we learned the word homeostasis and it's keeping a very equal and constant biological environment. It's important that the body keeps that. And that stands for S, stability. And that helps with proper immune function. And this is one of the things that we have seen that especially during this season, not just COVID season, but during the flu season, that people who don't get adequate rest, that their immune functioning depletes. And last but not least, T, thinker. Why? Because sleep has such an important role for our brains, particularly our memory, our functioning, our ability to concentrate. And so that acronym of rest underscores the importance of sleep. Now, if you don't get that, you can have some significant consequences, what I call TLC. So there are issues with regards to the top, the brain. We see that if you don't get good sleep, the consequences are that poor concentration, um, you're unable to process information. The L in the TLC acronym stands for the lower parts of the body, the limbs. So people who do not actually get enough sleep have problems with um, their limbs, they have problems with their stability, um, their gait, all these different functioning areas, and the C, in some ways stands for the core. And so there have been several studies that have shown that sleep is important for your metabolism, where they've seen that people who don't get good sleep are more at risk for obesity. They are less likely to lose weight even if they are exercising. And so those are some, just a, just a few consequences of poor sleep. Are there any steps that we might be able to take during the day that could help us sleep better at night, given all of those factors that play <laughs> into it. I know it's a lot. And, and, and the reason why it's a lot, and I don't want to overwhelm your attendees either and your audience, but sleep has been our greatest mystery and one of life's greatest enigmas. But the one step that, and there's several things that I would highly recommend that folks who are listening, I think it starts with a mindset really. Um, that yes, I'll give you tips and strategies how to improve your sleep, but it's important that you change your mindset. So I oftentimes say this, and not that I have created this, but I think I've credited to pushing this agenda. Treat sleep as an investment. What do I mean by that? It means, therefore, that you want to start your day with sleep. Let me say that again. Start 
your day with sleep. Why? Because oftentimes what we do know is that sleep is the one thing that gets shortchanged, where we're trying to go through life's hustle and bustle. And then we say, oh, well, I could just fall asleep for four hours and get up to do tomorrow's activities. But instead, if you treat sleep as an investment and if you start your day with sleep, therefore, you can almost reverse engineer your day particularly your next day. So if you know you're going to have a very busy day tomorrow, well, you got to put that fuel in. And the fuel is not necessarily nutrition, though that is important, but it's the sleep. It's the rest the night before that is important in providing you with the energy, the cognitive acuity, as well as the general sense of well-being and feeling good. And there have been studies that have shown too that people who sleep more and get better sleep are actually rated as more attractive. And so it's really a, a, a holistic type of investment, Luann. I love the thought and the analogy that you make that sleep is the start of your day and it's fuel. It's a ah. great way to think about it. People think of their food as fuel, so why not add sleep to that mix? Very, very great way to make people remember it. Absolutely. So I, I have a question about what that optimal sleep routine might look like. If you could outline it, what would it look like? So I, I think it varies. It really does vary. And, and so I know your question is asking for ideals because we live in a world where people just want bullets and summers. Um, but my, my, my brand of research is personalizing your sleep because what may work for me may not work for another person. But there are some fundamental truths that remain across no matter who and no matter what setting. So what you want to do is that there are certain things that you don't want to do before you, before you go to bed, particularly too soon. You want to avoid um, blue light. So I know a lot of us go to bed with our phones and our devices. And science has shown over and over that the blue light that is emitted, though there are some devices now that actually lower or change the blue light emission from devices, but blue light in general actually reduces the production of a very important hormone called melatonin that is responsible for the onset of sleep, as well as important chemicals that can bring you into deeper sleep. So you want to avoid that. You want to also ensure that your sleeping environment, and I want to be as general, as broad as possible because there are some people who may not actually have a bedroom. So oftentimes they said, create a, a wonderful bedroom environment and some of us don't. So I use the word sleeping environment. And so your sleeping environment must be a sanctuary. What does that mean? Ensuring that it's cool, quiet, and dark. Now, if you are a shift worker or you have a, an irregular work schedule and therefore um, a, an irregular sleeping pattern, then what you want to do is you want to use very dark blinds to block out light. Why? Because light and darkness are two fundamental cues that help to induce sleep or increase alertness and awakeness. Temperature is key. So around 65, 66, 67, 68 degrees is most optimal. And you want to ensure that you wind down. So I oftentimes say 30 minutes to 60 minutes before I head to bed, I ensure that I turn off, especially all those LED lights. They're, though they're energy um, efficient, but you want to turn those off or turn them down if you can, because you are preparing your body. So I brush my teeth um, in darkness. And those are some you know, important and critical tips and strategies that you can use to get the best um, sleep routine. Very interesting. How about tools? I know your specialty is technology. So are there tools out there that can help us get a better night's sleep? Or on the reverse side of that, are there some gizmos that maybe you don't want people to use? Sure. So, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I'll just kind of try and, and get get to that. Um, I think 
it's very similar to your previous question in the sense that as you're preparing um, a great sleep environment, you want to ensure that the bed is good and appropriate. The bedding can be a technology. This is why we have so many companies doing this and investing in this. Pillows as well. There are new types of pillows that provide you with enough um, you know, incline um, um, for many people. Um, smell is important and there are devices that can use aromatherapy to induce sleep and lighting and all. So in terms of gizmos and devices that are helpful, there are so many. Um, software apps, um, particularly, they proliferate our entire um, you know, phone systems and our technology systems. So bedtime stories, so calm. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, on the board for Mashi, which is you know the version for kids and families, um, people use noise optimizers as well, where it is said that white noise and pink noise and violet noise, and I'm a huge fan of brown noise as well. And it doesn't necessarily take a gizmo per se, but you could just Pop, pop those noises on your YouTube and you can listen to those and those can induce sleep and relax you and block out external sounds um, and factors that might be preventing. And there are certain devices, so the wearables that track sleep, there are some other devices as well that help to induce sleep. So there are these headbands that can emit pink noise and bone conduction um, that when you get to that portion of your sleep that's considered deep sleep, it can actually, through that technology, send you into deeper sleep and you can stay longer into deeper sleep and therefore a, most, a much more restful night. When you talk about white noise and pink noise and brown noise, help us understand what those are for, for those. I, I'm sure, very yes. familiar with white noise, but I don't know the others. No, no, that's fine. So essentially, these different color of noises have to do with the different wavelengths that are emitted. And so with white noise, which sounds like a shh, essentially all the different um, you know, wavelengths or noise wavelengths that are emitted, they're randomly emitted at varying degrees at different times. And so as you progress down the, 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 the different colors, the, the emission, and frequency of those um, noise wavelengths um, vary. So brown noise has this deep rumble, almost like the ocean. Um, white noise, everyone knows about that, but pink noise is a softer version um, of, of white noise where it's not as jarring. If you listen to white noise for a long period of time, it actually can sound jarring. And, and, and it is my belief that white noise might be most optimal for concentration as opposed to sleep. Um, and there are different things too. So like nutraceuticals, like melatonin supplements, I know that's a hot topic. And that's the one where I believe that I am less on board with. And, and, and I'm not trying to speak ill of any of those devices per se, but what I want your audience to be aware of is that most 70 something to about 80% of those supplements don't just have melatonin in them. They have some other product in them. So you got to be careful. And the reason why you have to be careful is because they're designated as nutraceuticals. And because of that, they're not regulated by the FDA. Right. So you people need to be aware of that. Yeah. Great tips. How about the next big thing in, in sleep science? What can we expect to see? I think there's going to be so many breakthroughs in terms of assessment of sleep. So typically sleep, as we know it from a consumer perspective, comes through having some form of wristwatch that tracks our sleep. But we know that those do not provide the most accurate. I know that there are several companies that are actually using other forms of devices such as headbands that does, I think, a much more accurate job of capturing sleep, but not just sleep in terms of how long did you sleep for and just some surface level deep or light sleep, but instead these devices mimic or gold standard measurements of sleep, such as polysomnography, 
that measures brain waves. And so those are some areas that I think from an assessment standpoint, but also it's more so talking about hacking. So not just sleep tracking, but sleep hacking. So you can hack people's dreams, you can hack their REM sleep, which is an important critical period. The science is very nascent at this point in time, it's still developing. And then another set of devices, I believe, what we call sleep optimizing. So not necessarily when you're trying to hack into someone's sleep to optimize it, meaning can you get the most out of five hours of sleep? Because we typically say seven to nine hours per day on average is optimal. But what if we can get the most out of someone's sleep over a five hour period where you're spending more time in certain stages of sleep? And that's what we're talking about, sleep optimizing. I think those are pioneering types of devices and technologies, but I believe in a few years, we will see those on the market. Very interesting. So how does stress and anxiety impact sleep? I know a lot of people talk about, you know, in stressful periods, it's really difficult to sleep through the night. So what are the tips you can offer to help them sleep better? So I think, you know, I will cluster the tips in two ways, um, behavior. So modifying your behavior. Um, and so obviously anxiety and stress are huge psychological factors that manifest in certain behaviors because if you're more anxious, you're more likely to eat carbohydrates mm -hmm. later at night. And if you're more stressed as well. But I think it's important that we wanna modify our behavior. So going to bed and waking up at the same time. This is what we call a routine. It's important that you do that. You wanna ensure that you have this um, steady routine. And one of the things I oftentimes tell people is that we don't really need an alarm clock. If you're well rested, if you wanna determine if you are well rested, go to bed when you are tired and you should wake up on your own without the assistance of an alarm clock. You wanna avoid alcohol, um, cigarette, um, caffeines. Why? Those can potentially have this false sedatory effect where, oh, let me um, drink a glass of wine and I'll fall asleep. But what happens is that that actually, you know, prevents you from falling into deep sleep and it fragments your sleep because a good sign of good sleep is that you sleep continuously throughout the night. And so you don't want to have this fragmented sleep and obviously reduce electronic devices. Um, and um, those are some you know, you know, critical things. But also from an environment standpoint, you want to um, ensure that you eliminate and avoid anything that is stressful too close to your bedtime. So if you're calling a loved one who may cause tremendous stress and frustration, I would avoid speaking with them too close to bedtime and perhaps chat with them earlier in the day. Very, very interesting. So if we were to start implementing all of the tips that you are providing, how long would it take us to really start to see the effects of, of implementing a routine that, that is different than what we're accustomed to? That's a great question. Um, and not as I am not trying to evade your question <laughs> per se, but it, it really depends. It depends on the severity of the sleep issue that that person has. And it also depends on the individual themselves. So here's what we do know, um, that you can actually feel the positive effects of a good night's sleep after one night. You can. You absolutely can. Now, for those of us who are significantly and chronically sleep deprived, it may take a week or weeks. No, what I would highly recommend, and this is where some of these wearables are helpful. So there are some proprietary um, sleep index scores you know, on these devices where they score your sleep. Was it good or fear or poor? And that can show you if you actually develop a healthy sleep routine, 
you can start to see the effects of that through your wearable. But in terms of you feeling it personally, it may take a day or it may take weeks. And so we, we have a 30 day program that, you know, we essentially walk people through trying to identify what are their triggers, both external and internal triggers that might be disruptive to their sleep, similar to some of the strategies and tips I provided earlier. We walk people through identifying those and finding easy to use corrective strategies that will allow them to one, get rid of those bad habits and develop much better, healthier sleep habits. Great information. So let's say we do this with, or, or that you're already a good sleeper, but your sleep is disrupted by a partner or maybe young children climbing into bed with you at 3 a.m. What can you do um, to, to try to resolve that? Is there Are there tips you can offer? Luann, if my wife was here, she would say, preach to the choir. <laughs> um, you may have a witness. Um, it's very tough, right? And I love that question because many of the strategies that I outlined earlier focuses on an individual, but especially if you are in a family setting where sleep is this core, you know, um, habitual experience, then it's much more difficult to change someone than your own. Um, so, uh, and, and, I, and I, my recommendations may sound a bit flip, but you know, um, there's some um, profundity there. First of which is change rooms if you can, um, because it's important that you get good, healthy sleep. Um, and, you know, I think this is why back in the day, and perhaps it's a practice today, where in, um, you know, a cohabiting type of situation where two individuals may share the same bed, and if someone has significant snoring or have significant restless leg or insomnia type symptoms that disturbs the other person, we oftentimes recommend that the person and this is where the compromise comes in, like who leaves the bedroom, right? Um, or who leaves the bed, um, but change rooms. Or if you don't want to do that, if you haven't reached that compromise or just culturally or personally don't want to do that, um, and depending on what the source of the disruption is, if it's person is just disruptive in terms of noise or snoring, we oftentimes recommend and suggest using earplugs. Um, if it's lighting, you know, you could wear those masks or use white noise or pink noise. But more seriously though, if you feel that your spouse or your partner or whomever you may share your sleep environment with has some sleep issue, get them tested. Um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has a wide and exhaustive inventory and repository of sleep specialists who might be able to test that person, that loved one, um, and provide them with the best guidance and treatment as to how they could improve their sleep health. Great advice. Well, I um, just have a couple more questions. Is, is there anything else that you would want to convey to our Look and Feel Better audience today that we haven't covered in regards to their sleep? Uh, the only thing I would say, and, and thank you so much, Luan, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, the only thing I would underscore um, is that be patient with yourselves. Be patient. I oftentimes say that sleep is the one behavior that we do not have control over. But there is something beautiful and magical about your sleep and our sleep. I truly believe it's the body's ability and it's the only time that the body takes over and says no. I am in control, right? When we Absolutely. eat, yes. when, yeah, when we eat, we're in control for the most part. When we exercise, we're in control. When it's stress, we're in control or someone else is causing that. But sleep is the only activity and behavior where we're unconscious and the body says, it's okay. I'm gonna clear whatever toxins are in your body. And we see this in terms of risk for dementia, as well as other 
heart disease and other diseases where sleep helps to clear out all of those toxins that can prevent those diseases and poor health outcomes. So be patient with yourselves and know it's something that is not part of our culture, the loss of control, but <laughs> allow yourself, allow your body yeah. because it's your, your, it's your body's way of taking care of itself. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Seishas. That was, that was, I think, one of the most interesting lectures I've heard in a long time, even though we were having a conversation. I wish I could have taken notes, and we've certainly got a recording that we will be able to post later. But one more question for the audience, because I'm sure they feel like I do, that so much great information has been shared. Where can people find you, see you, follow you to, to get more information on this subject? Well, you know, thanks again, Luann. I, I, I consider myself a humble servant. Yeah, I, I, uh, people can reach me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Aziz Asatius. I'm also on Facebook, Aziz Asatius. I am on LinkedIn, as Dr. Aziz Asatius. I'm on Twitter, reach me that way. And if they want to email me, um, they can email me at aziz.satius at nyulangone.org. Or if you want to check me out on my website, go to draziziseshas.com. Thank you so, so much. We so appreciate your time today. Thank you I, for I, having me. I know that I've learned a lot and I hope everyone else who has joined us did too. On behalf of our entire family with Look Good, Feel Better, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And also thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We hope it's been time well spent for you. Don't forget again to join our raffle you can text us at feelgood44321, or you can find us on the website. We hope you'll join us throughout the rest of the month, Look Good, Feel Better month, for some more of our Feel Better sessions. And we thank you again, Dr. Seishas. What a wonderful opportunity to chat with you. Have a wonderful day, everyone.